Hey, DJ, Hi, this is for you. Hello, hello, you. Hello, hello. Didn't want you to get too far behind. <laughs> Photography. And I'm hoping, since this is my advanced class, that when I point to some of these uh, diagrams that are up on the board, that y'all can give me the answers. And it really ought to sound like a course. All right? But if it doesn't sound like a course, we just need to work on the choir. Okay? All right? So... Here we go. Uh, does anybody remember what that is? Baseline. What is that? Waistline. Alright. If I measure from my baseline to my waistline, what is that? X height or body height. Alright. If I'm measuring from the lower part of my capital letter to the top part of my capital letter, what is that term? No. Cap height. Not, not, not X height. It's cap height. Okay. All right. What part of the character is that? Stroke. That's a stroke. Okay. Can you have thin and thin, thick and thin strokes? Yes. yes. Okay. Can you have strokes that vary, that change thicknesses and thin? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. What part of the character is that? A stem. That's a stem. What's another word for it? Backbone, okay, or spine. I've even heard it referred to as a spine. All right. Does anybody remember what this is? Stress. Stress. All right. The curved part of a character is stress. What is another way that a character can be stressed? If it tilts, right? If I if the character is perfectly straight up, what is it? Not stressed. If it's tilted, it's stressed. Okay. Right, does anybody remember what this is? Foot. That's the foot of a character. Does anybody remember what this is? That's the arms. All right. Anything above my waistline is my A cinder. Anything below my baseline is my D cinder. All right. It, and that is what part of the character? Shoulder. Shoulder. All right. It, I know that's not the greatest finishing off stroke, but what is that stroke called? Serif. Serif. Okay, and this one is kind of new. What is this one? Arc, arc, arc. arc of stem. All right, that little game we played made that stick in my head too because I did, I kept wanting to say descender. Yes, sir. but it's the arc of the stem. Okay, all right, we know that is the leg. leg. That's correct. All right, what kind of serif is that? Uh, that's sand. All right, that's no, sand. It's serif. No, it's a regular serif, but it's a ball serif. Ball terminal. Ball terminal, ball serif. Okay? Alright? Does anybody remember what this is? Spine. That's the spine. Alright? Okay? We kind of go back over here to that, right? Remember the spine? Everything just because it's curved don't mean it's not a spine. Okay? Alright? What is that? That's a ligament, right? Nope. That, this is a ligament. These two, that is a crossbar or a cross stroke. You know how it goes across your spine? I don't know about A and E. A and E, yeah. That is, that's a bar crossbar, right? But that could be a bar crossbar, too. Okay? All right. Now, that, to me, that's more of a ligature. Because it's joining two t characters together. That's right. Same thing there. That's a ligature. All right? Okay, all right. But when you have a fancy ligature, it's called a gadzook. Gadzook. Remember, if it's a fancy ligature, it's a gadzook. So fancy. I have no idea where that term comes from because that's the first I heard that term last year for the first time. All right, but I've noticed in some videos, you know, Mr. Neil tries to teach himself stuff, so Mr. Neil goes to YouTube, and I watch YouTube videos, and I notice they're starting to use that word more, you know. We put a little gadzook there. To, I'm like, really? Wow, okay. All right. What is that part of the uh, area? Oh, did we skip? Yeah. Uh, yep. We skipped the whole column, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. All right. What is this? Apex vertex. Apex vertex. Apex vertex. Yeah. Okay. What kind of counter is that? Open. Open. That's an open counter. And then the that would be a closed open. counter. That's a squash. Okay. That's a swash. Right. That's a swash. Right. And then the finishing off part of your serif, that would be the terminal. That's where it terminates. Terminal. That's 21. Huh? That's, yeah, 21. 
And then I <laughs> ball serif, and that's one. So I skipped that whole thing. Sorry about that. What's okay. number 16? Number 16. Uh, oh, that's the joint. Oh. Where two, that's where two, did I skip that with two? Uh, yeah, oh, my so. God. <laughs> I was like, because you went from D to R. All right. Well, that's yeah. not a problem. We're getting back to it. Okay. All right. Um, we left off here, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Where we have an open counter, what is that open area of our counter? White space. White space. Well, no, that's that's kind of in design when you got it. It's 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 kind of a camera term, aperture. Oh, aperture. You know how you know the how a camera works. The lens opens up and closes. That's the aperture. Think about that. It's the aperture of the counter. Okay. All right. What is the space in between two individual characters? Kerning. Kerning. Okay. All right. Now, I'm, I'm getting a little confused on that. I'm going to have to do a little research. The spacing in between the individual characters in a word is called tracking. No, that's in the... I thought it was, I thought it was a line of text. The space yeah, in that That's word spacing, right? Yeah. Because I think this PowerPoint here, she's got it back, but she's got it... Different. Mm -hmm. All right. We did now this this was provided by the state of Georgia. You would hope that they got that right. Oh. But kerning, the way I was taught, that's kerning. Yeah. That's word spacing, and then the whole line of text or in a sentence, the spacing of the characters is tracking because yeah. the computer tracks the spacing. That's why it makes more sense to me that way. All right. All right. If I was to do a paragraph and it was aligned this way, what is that? Justified left, ragged right. Okay. Justified left, ragged right. This would be Justified right, ragged right. left. Uh, this would be uh, center. Uh, no, this one is justified because it's equal on both sides. This is center. You see the difference? It's justified to the center. You would have ragged left and right. So if I was, and this would be justified left and right. Now, what is it happens sometimes when you use this justified left and right? You get some weird what? Spacing. Word spacing, spacing, right? Okay. All right. If I was to give you a diagram that had the individual parts of the of a character, and this was a stroke, this would be my thick stroke. That would be my Wait. thick. This would be my thin. thin. So this would be my thin stroke. This would be my thick stroke. This would also be my Stem or backbone or spine. All right. What are these beginning and finishing off strokes? Sarah's. And if I was to measure an individual character from the left side of the character to the right side of the character, I'd be measuring its what? It's two words. Starts with an S. Set. Set. Width. There you go. Okay. Set width. Okay. All right. Again, if I'm doing a measurement from my baseline to my waistline, what is that? Athletic. No. no. Baseline. baseline to waistline. X height or body height. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to go over this PowerPoint, and the reason I went over this is this PowerPoint should make more sense to you. Now, since we are recording this, uh, this this uh, PowerPoint actually talks, but I turn the volume down. All right. Because I, it, it, you know, it ain't mic'd up like me. It ain't special. All right. So, so uh, like I said, let's go through this, and then once we're done, I'm gonna go over the rest of that, and then I'm gonna go over the PowerPoint that accompanies that other information. Uh, this is actually provided by the CTAE statewide. Um, it basically. And the reason I like to show this is because uh, what was happening is you had different graphic arts teachers teaching, teaching it, and one university might have used slightly different terms than another university that taught graphic design, um, like spine or backbone or, you know, STEM, that kind of thing. And uh, what was happening is kids was taking statewide tests, and then they weren't passing because the terminology was a little different. So what they've done is they tried to introduce the ability to that we're all teaching the same terms, all right? But that's not to say if you pursue a career in graphic communications that you would end up at some university and they use slightly different terms, but at least you'll know what the concepts are talking about, 
Okay? All right. So we know that typography is study the elements of type, including the shape, size, spacing of a character. What is the shape, size, and spacing of the character? What's the other word we use for that? Starts with an E. Elements. elements. That's the elements of the character, right? The shape, the size, the color, the texture, those things. Remember, those are, that's a big word in graphic engineering, elements. All right? Typography plays an important role in the audience perception of your document, or project, or its information. All right? Typography helps create informational relationships. Now, this is another thing that I want to start seeing in your designs. I need you to see, to, to see if you could start grouping information by using the elements of color, shape, size, and texture to group your information correctly. All right? Um, the way you do informational relationships, it helps you organize your information and it helps keep things interesting through the use of fonts, letters, and symbols. Alright? The number one rule of typography is legibility. Alright? Making sure the audience can read and understand your text. This is especially important when you reverse type. In other words, you have a white character on a dark background. Alright? What generally happens if you've got a uh, area of your font that's really small what, and it fills in. It's going to be very hard to read, right? Mm -hmm. All right? So usually if you got like a black background with a white character, you probably want to choose a font that has big what areas? Counter big counter areas. So that there's no chance that it's going to plug up. All right? Um, the brochure that we're doing for Gika, right? That's why I didn't want you to give me a bunch of colored backgrounds with text in it because these laser printers are not really designed like a digital press to give you that sharp counter areas. We get layers filled in. Okay? Um, we need to group similar information together so that you create relationships between the similar kinds of information. Once you design a pattern or a consistency or uniformity, you need to repeat that pattern. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. All right? And one way to create interest is to always create contrast. You're always looking to create a little conflict in your designs, whether it's two colors. If you have a cool color like blue, you might want to have a warm color to compete with it. All right? Well, it's like the superheroes in all the cartoons and the movies. There's always the ice guy, and there's always the fire guy, and they're always mortal enemies. You know, cool versus warm. Okay? But you could use that contrast to create interest. All right? And the reason you're doing, making that contrast like serif, sans serif font, there's a little contrast there, all right, is you could help establish a hierarchy. All right? When we establish a hierarchy, we are making something what? More important, less important, less important, less important, that kind of thing. All right, we're establishing a hierarchy. All right, font originally included, included typeface, the style, the size, but the term is now interchangeable with typeface. We know how many, if you're designing something, how many fonts did you use in your design? Two, no more than three. If you're pushing three, you're really you're trying to walk a tightrope there. Because what happens is you get too much variety, it becomes confusing for your viewer. All right? With the font family, if you're dealing with one serif and one sans serif, you can create enough uniformity of information by using the bold, the italics, the you know that kind of thing within those font. But there's enough differentiation there, you can work on that. Okay. Um, again, font families such as variations of time new uh, uh, Roman regular, italic, and bold. Roman describes a font with additional attributes such as italics. Decorative fonts are those used for display. Script fonts are real fancy ones. Black letter fonts, they imitate the antique uh, European fonts of handwritten. And then monostasis space fonts, fonts that mimic the spacing produced by a typewriter. And I'll be honest with you, I've been doing this my whole life, and I ain't never used mono space fonts. 
I've never seen it say, oh, this is a monospace font. This, why you would want to typeset something that has the same spacing as a typewriter, I have no idea. Because what typewriters used to do is it would add a little extra space in case you made an error and you had to white it out. So that means that monospace so, is basically like another space? It's, it's type of, well, it's, it's, it's spacing in between characters that's a little bit larger than normal. than normal because the old typewriters used to create a little extra space in between characters yeah. so in case you made a mistake you could easily use white out to white it out and then go back and correct it. Okay. Alright? Yes sir? I, I, be honest with you, I've never seen any font described as a monospace so font. I have no idea. I'm just I'm just thought I'm just letting you know. Just letting you know. All right, typeface design for the letters, numbers, and symbols that make up a font. We know serif is a typeface that ext with extensions at the end of the main strokes that define each letter. These extensions are called serifs. Serifs, you have bracketed serifs. That's one that goes from thin to thick. Sans serif, they don't have any serifs at all. Uh, old style have bracketed serifs like I was just talking about. There's, there's a a stroke thin to thick. Transitionals have a much dramatic stroke from thin to thick. Okay, because imagine old typographers having to hand carve wooden letters. It would be very difficult to go from very thin to very thick. All right, that's more of an industrial revolution type thing. Okay, all right. Modern modern fonts would have dramatically changing strokes from thin to thick, or or dramatically changing slight and then all of a sudden wide and real quick. Okay? And uh, so, and then slap serifs are very heavy, very thick serifs, very thick fonts. <clears throat> Alright, we know that this is a serif font, this is a sans serif font. Spacing choices, this is where it got, like, this is where I noticed it was a little different. Um, Proportional fonts are spaced according to the size of the letters. Mono space fonts are spaced the same for every letter, like an old typewriter, but they generally were a little bit wider than that. Tracking, see this is where they said tracking the space between letters in a word. I've always heard that as word spacing and in a sentence it's tracking. Alright? Now, if you got a multiple choice test, and it asks you what this spacing is, and they've got the word tracking, but they don't have the word spacing. They have kerning and something else and something else. You need to choose tracking, all right? Because we know kerning is just two characters, all right? All right. Uh, ligatures, that's that area that connects two uh, letters together, two characters. Um, now, if I had the volume turned up on this, she calls this leading. It's letting. I don't care. I don't know if she just didn't know, but it comes from the strips of lead that was used in the old wooden type to separate the distance in between lines of text. And she could say leading all she wants. It's letting. All right. Now, this is EM space and EN space. I honestly, in all my years, I've never selected a font because of the M spacing or N spacing. And basically what that is, is that's the width of the spacing within your M. And that's the width of the spacing within your N. And I guarantee you, I've never gone and, let me go look at a font. No, I don't like that N. Alright, I don't go, oh, I don't like that M. Alright, so... Honestly, I don't know what that's for. Some advanced graphic designer that's more intelligent than I am is going to have to explain that. Because I have no idea. Because it says the space of the width of a capital M. Why don't they just measure the set width? Call it a day. All right, hanging indents. The paragraph's first line is flush. Left, but the remaining lines are indented. Tabs, you know, if you hit the tab, it'll move over and automatically certain number of spaces. All right. Widows are single sentences or phrasing at the bottom of a column or page. The rest of the paragraph appears on the next page or column. 
orphans, single lines of text that appear at the top of a column or page with the rest of the paragraph appearing on previous page or columns. All right. So if you have a bunch of text and then it says continued on page five and you go to page five and you see like four words there, that's your widow. What? Right? Well, am, I, am I doing that right? Yeah, Single sentence or phrase at the bottom of comp page, the rest paragraph appears on the next page. I thought it was orphans. That would be an orphan. Okay, that's an orphan. All right, that's an orphan. Oh, likes orphans. All right. Yeah, go home, tell your mom and dad, your graphic arts teacher says he does not like widows and orphans. All right. I will. All right. Um, so if you start off, I guess so. This would, if that's an orphan, if you start off with just a few lines of text and then create the rest of it there, yeah. that is a what? Widow. Yeah. All right. You know who does that all the time now? Whoa. Website designs. Oh yeah. Because they'll put one or two lines, and then you got to click on it to read the rest of it. That's like going to a different page, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. And I swear to God, the other day I was reading a newspaper and it said continue on page five. And I went to page five, there was two words. That was all that was left in the in the article. It was like a whole big old long article. So go to page five, finish it. It's two words. Now, I don't know how much time they had to edit, but I think I could have edited a few words up in the front end of that to get that all on one page. Okay? Alright, All right. and then we went over the alignments, Le left align, right, whoop, turned it off. Left align, right align, center, justified. Okay. Nope, that's not it. You was hoping, wasn't you? You was missing, I, miss me, I was hoping that was the last one. I was hoping there was more. Oh my God. Yeah, holding up PowerPoint, huh? All right. Uh, this thing keeps falling off, so I'm going to have, have to just keep it in the video. Okay. All right. What am I showing in this diagram here? Um, different colors. Informational relationships. Oh. All right. I can create informational relationships by position, like a business card. Yeah. Name, title, name of the company. Street address, city, state, email, phone number, fax number. You've seen business cards. They group it. They create informational relationships. But understand that I can also create informational relationships by changing the color. Right? Big old heading. That's a, 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 re a relationship with this information. This information, but I've changed the information relationship between those two by changing the color. Alright? And then to keep it in to keep our designs interesting, right? I can come up with some unique ways that I lay it out. But I need to still remember to think about my informational relationships. Okay? Alright? Keep things interesting, right? Okay? You might want to use one font that is a serif or a fancy font, and then one font that is a simple font. So that's like showing what's That's creating contrast. It's creating a competitive feel between your, your typography. Hi. It's help. You could establish your hierarchy with that. That's correct. Okay. What kind of font is that? That's a serif. Serif. Sans serif. All right. That's your, I just went over that. We just went over that. All right. One of the things that we need to talk about in the elements of design and the use of type is contrast. Can you read this? No. You can't read that? Can anybody read that? No. Nope. What's the top line? Can you read this? Can't read that one, right? Why? Too small. All right. Now, how many of you ever seen a car commercial and at the bottom of the commercial they put all that text at the bottom, yeah. right? And it's about that big, all right? Now what's nice about that is legally they have to put that information on there. But they got some pretty good lobbyists and they say, yeah, we got to put it on there but we're going to make it this big and we're going to make it last for four seconds, all right? 
that happens. All right, it's a design decision. All right. Now I know somebody might see this on YouTube and go, "Mr. Neal's, you know, running down automobile industry." No, Mr. Neal, not. Mr. Neal, telling you the truth. Okay, or at least the truth as I see it. Okay. All right. Can anybody read that? No. No, no. Uh, all right. Why? It's too bright. There's not, there's not enough contrast between the white background and the yellow text. If it were on behind black, that would probably work because my contrast would be higher. Right? Okay? Alright? So again, that's that contrast. That's that. Size can be a contrast. Size. Color could be a contrast color. Alright? Think of colors as having a number between 1 and 10. 0 is light, or 1 is light. 10 is dark. Hey, Carolyn, we're videotaping, so come on in. And you might want to sit back there, okay? And you can log in back there and do that stuff for Mr. Townsend, okay? All right. Uh, size, contrast, all right? Anybody tell me what that says? Right, it's Spanish. Can you read this? And I had it confirmed this morning because I'll be honest with you, I didn't. I don't know how to write in Spanish, so I googled it. I said, "Google what? How do you say? Can you read this in Spanish?" And it popped up that. And then a couple of my intro Spanish students, I said, "What does that say?" And they started like smiling. I was like. <laughs> Can you read Spanish? And they were like, yeah. I said, then what's it say? Can you read this? And I said, yeah. That's, that's, I'm, I'm, it's not a trick question. I just want to make sure I didn't put up something up there that was obscene. Just didn't know it. Okay. Huh? The question mark. But, you know, it's funny. I, it was like that on the screen. And I was thinking, why is the question mark? Is that the way they write it? They write it upside down? Is it a question? Okay. It's supposed to be on both sides. Yeah, it's supposed to be one over, like the one in the front was straight upside down. How do you know that? Because I'm Spanish. Okay. All right. Well, see, I did not know that. That's not good to know. Good to know. All right. When we're using type, we need to know the audience that we're designing for, right? So if I read you this paragraph, what would be your understanding of typography in the application of this, this sentence, the sentence I have written on the whiteboard, be in context of the multicultural justification in the application of the words used in this sentence? Does that make a lot of sense to you? If you, if you tried to really decipher it, right? Okay. You would have difficulty deciphering it. I know that there's a bunch of my intro kids had difficulty deciphering that sentence. All right. If I'm designing a, a brochure for somebody that's a doctor and it has a lot of medical terms, do you think I could use a lot of big medical words in it? Yes. All right. If it's designed for a group of doctors. All right. But if I'm designing for a bunch of students that are learning to be doctors, I might need to dumb it down a little bit, right? Okay, and if I'm designing a brochure for 20 years olds, I might 20 year olds. I might need to use words that 20 year olds would understand. But if I'm designing a brochure for eight year olds, I probably want to use words that eight year olds understand. All right. So when you're designing and you're using typography, you're giving a message, right? You need to know your audience. Now, uh, one of my uh, colleagues in Savannah, she has a project that I thought was pretty cool when she was explaining it to me. What she does is that she lets you choose a uh, famous book from literature and then you have to design a cover for the ages between 8 and 12. Another cover with the same title for people 13 to 20 year olds and then another cover for people that are 20 years old, but it's the same book cover, but you have to design it for different age groups. So it's like different? Yes, yeah. because you would have to design it differently if that's the age group you were shooting for. All right? 
Uh, and then spelling and grammar. If you've got misspellings and your grammar is not very good, it's going to jump out. Okay? All right? And that can even go for if you're putting something on social media and you decide to use text words instead of real words, your audience might get lost because your audience is the world and they might not understand. Now, 10 years from now, might be a different story. Because we know language changes. It grows. It's just it's, it's organic. Alright? I wish we went back to the old English days. Where art thou? Alright? Yeah, where art thou? You scallywag. Okay? Alright. Okay? I always love that scene in the Avengers where he goes, he starts talking to Th Iron Man starts talking to Thor. Does mother know you have her drapes? Okay. All right. You don't remember that scene? Oh, when Iron Man and Thor get in a fight? I just, that's actually kind of funny. Okay. All right. All right. When we're creating hierarchy relationships, we could use size. Size matters. In design, size matters. Yeah. Okay. We could use. What I got written down there? Style. You can have fancy or fancy. You could, if, if, if I'm designing something for, that's kind of personal, party, all right, that's elegant, I might want to use a font that's kind of fancy and elegant looking. But if I'm designing Beach Bash Party number 2018, I might use real thick fonts but change the colors, do all kind of stuff like that to make it look fun. Okay, all right. Again, I can use color to create my hierarchy. Okay. But I also, eventually, the whole idea is to make it interesting for somebody to look at. All right. Now, one of the things that, uh, do y'all, I, I, I probably might have asked you this before, but does anybody know about the Statesboro Rattlesnake Roundup? No. Okay, so every year in Statesboro, Georgia, all the good old boys get together and go hunt rattlesnakes. And then they drop them, they catch them alive, and drop them in a big old pen. And you can go see this big old pen, and it's full of rattlesnakes. And it's pretty wild because if you like kick the side of the pen, you'll hear a wave of spread through the oh. thing. It's weird. Alright? But, well, I, I, as far as I know, nobody's died. Alright? But they've been supposedly doing this for years. Yes, sir? How tall is it? Is it the the pen's, about, pen's about chest high. Yo. Oh, I, I see parents holding their kids. Hey, look! Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, 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 but, again, one of the most interesting designs, and, and to have you think about this, this was about 30 years ago when I was in college and I saw this. They designed, they had a picture of the rattles, right, of the rattlesnake, and then they had a picture of a, the rattlesnake's head. Oh. And then interweaved between the text was states for a rattlesnake roundup. So the body of the snake was actually the title, Statesboro Rattlesnake Roundup, and then the article was wrapped intermixed with the snake title. And I just thought it was really cool. And, and, and if you think about it, that design is stuck in my head for 30 years. Alright? That's pretty cool, I think. Okay? Alright. Um... What is my measurement from baseline to baseline? Baseline to baseline, x height. No, that's my waist, baseline to waistline. Letting. Because my baseline to baseline is a line of text, right? This is a line of type, this is a line of type. Baseline to baseline is my letting. Okay? Alright. Does anybody remember what the rule of the hundreds is? Rule of the hundreds? Websites do this all the time. Oh, the golden rule? Nope, 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 nope. 
If I can get you to read the first hundred words of an article, I can probably get you to read the whole article. So what they do, and you've seen this before, they make the, the first hundred words in great big sentences with a lot of space around it, and then the article is real tight with the rest. Of it. And websites do this all the time. You've seen it. They'll give you this little teaser heading with about a paragraph of text, and you got to click on it to go to the next page. Right? You don't like that? You know what I don't like is when they, they fool you with a heading. You think it's about one thing, and then when you click on it, you read the, start reading the article, you realize... Clickbait. That, 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 yeah, clickbait, is that what they call that? There's no dinosaur. Okay. Yeah, that's what they'll say. Dinosaur found in Amazon. And then you start reading the article, and what it is, they found the dinosaur bones. You know what I mean? All right. So, all right, I think that's everything I wanted to cover today in typography. All right. So I think we're going to be wrapping the video up now. Diedrich, this is for you, buddy. We're going to be sending this to you. We'll see you later.